All righty. Good morning, everybody. My name is Drew Geis. I am a Director of Product Marketing, and welcome to How Digital Transaction Management Can Contribute to Growth and Stability of Marketplace Lending. First off, before we get started, I want to thank everybody very much for joining us. Uh, good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Good afternoon to those of you on the East. Today we're going to give a short introduction to DocuSign, do the same for eOriginal, and then spend most of the time hearing directly from one of our joint customers funding circle. And with that, just want to introduce the, the speakers. Again, my name is Drew Geis. I'm a Director of Product Marketing here at DocuSign. I'm joined by my colleague, Jason Stubberfield, who is a, has been with DocuSign for four and a half years. In the last three works specifically in financial services, and recently actually has been spending most of his time in marketplace lending. From eOriginal, we have John Jacobs. Uh, John is the Director of Sales Development for eOriginal. From my experience with John, I know him to be an expert in many areas of financial services, everything from equipment leasing to marketplace lending. John, in addition to spending a lot of time working directly with clients, spends, spends his time working with rating agencies, financial custodians, funders, and other key influencers and the industry to drive adoption of digital transaction management. And then last but certainly not least, we're joined by Thomas Meister of Funding Circle. He is Senior Counsel, Capital Markets and Finance and Funding at Funding Circle USA. And together with Funding Circle's Capital Markets team, Tom is responsible for structuring, execution, and distribution of Funding Circle's offerings to institutional and accredited investors. Again, we're going to start with a, a very quick introduction to DocuSign. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand, hand it over to Jason to to run us through a couple of slides. Thank you, Drew, and thank everyone for joining today, and let's go ahead and get started. Um, so here at DocuSign, we have a belief that all successful businesses will be 100% digital, and we've developed that belief working with our current customers and clients similar to um, a lot of you that are on the, on the call today and on the webinar today, and also looking at the market. Right? Organizations that rank high on the digital maturity scale, they earn 13% more revenue. They get to keep 50% of that, more of that revenue, and ultimately they have higher market valuations. So where does DocuSign fit into that digital maturity scale? Um, a lot of the organizations we work with and a lot of you on the line today have invested a lot of time and money into back-end systems, um, technologies such as ERP, CRMs. Um, for our marketplace lenders on the call today, you have um, portals that you've developed, the kind of these online portals that help you facilitate and, and interact with your consumers and borrowers for our banking. Banks and credit unions on the line, you have LLS systems and cores. And ultimately, those are put in place so that you can interact with your constituents, your consumers, your customers, your partners. Um, for the webinar today, more importantly, with the borrowers and your investors. And so what we have seen talking you know, with our clients and customers that a lot of these systems are disconnected systems. Um, there's manual processes that get put in to these processes where there's paper that is being introduced. And here at DocuSign, when paper is being introduced, it really resorts into a poor customer experience. And so there's a better way to do business. And with DocuSign, we allow you to interact with those back-end systems you've invested in and being able to transact with those consumers, those customers, partners, um, also, you know, those borrowers and investors, and then back to those systems that you've invested in. You do it with DocuSign in a completely digital manner and also keeping in with compliance for your examiners and regulators for your processes. We have another belief here at DocuSign, and that is DocuSign is the fastest, most secure way to make every decision and approval digital so you can keep life and business moving forward. And so that's all I have for the DocuSign part today, and we'll pass it on to my good friend, John Jacobs at eOriginal. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so briefly, just a little bit about uh, eOriginal, uh, who we are. eOriginal has been around for uh, uh, just about 20 years, uh, coming on this year actually, and we were founded for the purposes of, of really creating a fully electronic mortgage process. Um, our core focus um, in, in this electronic and digital process was really to ensure 
uh, that when you took the financial document signing process electronic, that what you ended up with um, was, was something similar to what you had in the paper world, something that is unique, that's negotiable, that's investable, that you could uh, uh, with confidence pass to, to multiple parties post-closing and, and really have all those other parties uh, instilled with the confidence that what they're receiving um, has not been devalued just because it was created and managed electronically. Uh, you know, whether it's moving from a custodian, uh, going into a special purpose vehicle as part of a securitization. Um, so as you can see, uh, we have really a wealth of experience as it relates to creating the first out of many different asset classes um, uh, electronically, all the way through the first securitizations of electronic contracts. And uh, we've spent a lot of time and focus over the years in working with those various third parties, whether it be ratings agencies, custodians, servicers, anybody uh, throughout the life cycle of a financial instrument who might touch it, uh, need access to it, um, even regulators. And we'll, we'll talk a little more um, about that as, as we move forward. As far as DocuSign and eOriginal is, is concerned, where uh, where did this uh, partnership come into play? Um, yeah, it was actually at the request of, of a customer, um, actually going on about a decade ago, maybe a little more, um, where really there was a large customer that, that we had both worked with who really requested a best-in-class solution, a solution that would suffice all of their needs um, regarding the ability to electronically originate and electronically execute uh, financial assets, as well as all of their post-closing needs. Um, how do you manage those assets electronically? How do you move those assets into a securitization electronically um, without the perception that the, the, the value uh, might, might not be the same as, as what it once was in, in the paper world? So between both of our organizations, we have been used uh, to execute millions and millions of financial transactions uh, electronically, manage billions uh, to trillions of dollars of, of financial assets uh, electronically, and it really is, uh, as I mentioned, at the drive of a, of a customer many, many moons ago, um, it really is a best-in-class, completely digital solution, um, regardless of the asset class. And just a, a, a few examples of, of customers, um, both on our system. As you can see, this represents a variety of different asset classes, um, post-closing, uh, whether it be the chattel and, you know, all the way through different asset classes, um, and all with, with very similar needs as it relates to capital markets uh, and, and financial needs post-closing. Uh, regardless of the, of the asset class. So as I had mentioned, the, the, the solution is a pretty diverse set of, of, of capabilities, regardless of the asset that you're signing, whether it be MPL or traditional finance, you know, branch banking to, to automotive. And as Jason had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, so what, what problems do we solve? I think in the, the MPL space, we've, we've, we've identified that a lot of your marketplace originators have really done a phenomenal job um, at streamlining the front end processes, marketing to customers, giving customers a wonderful user experience. Why, why do this and why are we trending that way? Well, it, you know, it does lead down to the customer experience uh, in creating the, the, the best and most efficient way for for borrowers and consumers to access and, and electronically sign their documents. Uh, but with the, the ever-changing world and evolution of technology, um, the, the driving needs have, have been able or have been really geared towards being able to access one's document and, um, and, and loans and deals from really anywhere, whether it be mobile devices, uh, you know, cutting all the man hours that, that you can uh, from the process. Uh, we'll, we'll also talk a little bit more about that um, as we um, lead on, but the, the front end efficiencies in really cutting down the, the cycle of funding, right, getting money to the consumer as fast and efficient as possible, all the way to the back end. What are some of the problems that, that are solved there? How can you efficiently 
um, sell, transfer, and securitize the, the assets? How can you uh, work with various parties such as custodians or servicers to, to certify and to validate those assets on, on behalf of other parties? It really is, uh, there's it often is what I'd say, there are two general parts of the solution. We'll talk about a few buckets that exist there uh, here in just a couple of moments, but there are two general pieces, right? How do you execute uh, in the most efficient manner possible all of the front-end activity. Um, and then also, what happens after it's signed? How do you execute and manage all of that back-end or post-closing activity, as, as we like to call it? So a lot of the problems that exist with taking a piece of paper, putting it in front of a borrower, and sending it all the way through a securitization, um, the, the problems that exist with every manual um, labor hour that's put into touching those paper documents, um, there, there are a lot of those efficiencies that the that the solution is is meant to solve. Now, many of you might not have seen a slide su such as this before, and we we often we often call it a, a spaghetti plate. But if um, if you think about you know how fragmented the world is from business process uh, to to the use of multiple technology platforms today, there are a lot of people from employees to to, to partners to borrowers to funders and custodians that that need to touch or have access to to the technology at, at any given point in time. Um, and the, today, a lot of companies have done a really good job at streamlining some of the internal processes. Uh, the point and, and the, the key around digital transaction management is making all of this work together. Um, you know, we, we, everybody has started to adopt something electronically, right? I think you need to go a, a little beyond that. Um, connect all the dots and make sure that there's one scalable collater collaborative platform in which everybody who, who touches this, uh, this process, who touches a document through its life cycle, um, can work together in, in the most efficient manner. So in, in most cases, what we do is, is, is as a team and as uh, digital transaction management uh, vendors and experts, we, we like to take the spaghetti plate that exists um, and, and make it a little cleaner, right? So clean it up, make it scalable, and connect everyone much more efficiently. Security and compliance are, are absolutely uh, key drivers. Um, if you can, and I'm sure many of those who, who are participating now, um, know and have identified, especially since 2007, this is an ever-changing regulatory environment. Um, the, the, the security of the platforms that, that you use to interact with customers um, and, and how you use and leverage those platforms um, to interact with investors and, and third parties uh, post-closing. Um, maintaining regulatory compliance, uh, it changes quarter by quarter, and it's, it, every quarter it becomes even more critical and even more important um, from complying with you know, some of the new CFPB um, rules, uh, you know, if you're in the mortgage in industry, TILA and TRID, um, all the way to, you know, OCC, if you're a, if you're a major financial institution, you know, they, they put a, a lot of onus on, on you as an originator, as a financial institution, to, to really vet the, the, the solutions and the technology that, that you use. And this is not to mention SEC, and I'm sure we have a lot of investors um, and, and participants in, in the marketplace industry who are buying, um, participating in, or investing in, in loans. Uh, if you're setting up funds and trusts, you know, the, the SEC, some of the, the rules and regulations that they have with, with, with respect to, to the investment strategies uh, within these assets, it's ever-changing. I, th I think we've seen, look, the FDIC is, is, is doing some things and, you know, there's even further uh, regulatory scrutiny and, and interest um, as it relates to, to marketplace assets. So I think we will see in the coming year, in the coming couple of years, uh, the, the feds and regulators take an even closer look. So in ensuring the security and the compliance of the, the overall solution that, that you have, I think every day um, is really becoming more critical um, and even more so as we look out to, to where this market goes and where other asset classes and how other asset classes participate in the market um, go in the future. Now, from uh, MPL, you know, marketplace lending, to traditionally originated assets, uh, whether it be auto, 
chattel, mortgage, uh, what should we consider um, as originators, as investors, as other third parties, as, as, uh, such as custodians, um, when we're deploying a, a fully digital finance process? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have a couple of key buckets typically that I like to throw it in, the, the um, origination and execution bucket, um, as well as the, the post-closing bucket, but I, I'm going to break that down a, a little more here because I think there are a couple of very critical elements um, that we want to get into. So as far as origination, I think, as I mentioned earlier, uh, MPL, uh, you know, these originators, they've done a phenomenal job at really figuring this part of it out, marketing to, marketing to customers, uh, creating more of a, a consistent um, and user-friendly experience for, for those borrowers or for those individuals uh, and customers who actually access uh, their platform. Uh, but across the board, wh whether it be a marketplace asset um, all the way to, to traditional assets, you know, automotive, chattel, mortgage, uh, the origination process is going to be inclusive and, and variable. Um, there, there will be titling or, you know, diff you know, decisioning, different elements of the process that, that need to be involved. But first and foremost, when we think about the digital transaction management process, we think, how does it originate? How do you take a, a consumer or a customer's electronic information and add that electronic information to a customer-specific agreement or, or document? Um, and, and that's typically a phase that we call creating an executable document, something that has customer-specific information um, that they could review and, and sign. So through this uh, origination and execution process, you go through those natural progressive uh, steps. You decision the customer, you add the, the data to the document electronically, and then with solutions such as DocuSign, you would present that executable document to the consumer, enabling them with, with the ability to apply their electronic signature, electronic initials, et cetera, to the document um, where requested. Now, the other bucket that I mentioned earlier, post-closing, uh, after the, the final signatures have been applied to the document, this is where we really talk about two key uh, but very critical elements of the process. And much of what you see here, whether it be from vaulting services all the way through transferable record services, it really is based off of the, the concept of meeting these, these two critical uh, requirements. Um, one is having a unique and identifiable electronic asset, something that's similar to that piece of paper with a wedding signature that, that, that we used to have. Uh, often days, uh, we, we, we call this an authoritative copy. Uh, we call it an authoritative copy because some of the legislation, whether it be the, the state uniform electronic transactions laws or whether it be the uniform commercial code, um, also refer to it as, as an authoritative copy. What does this mean? It means that, that you or the system have taken appropriate steps to identify that just like you had in the paper world, there's something unique that exists and, and there is not the possibility that there could be multiple versions of that asset floating around that all look, feel, and seem to be original. Uh, so in many cases, this, is, this involves the ability of identifying um, copies of the asset as merely just copies and having one secure location in which that original or authoritative copy might exist. Uh, the other key concept uh, that really a lot of this revolves around is managing and enabling uh, the ability to securely transfer the custody, just like you would possession in, in, in the paper world, of that asset post-closing. Um, whether it's working with a custodian and, and you meet, need to meet the you know, SEC you know, custody rules to, to ensure that, that you've provided an auditable um, chain of evidence to, to show that the, you know, the third parties who, who are managing a fund on your behalf have properly received custody of an electronic original uh, document. So a, a lot of it really revolves around those key concepts. And if you think general vaulting services that uh, we started many years ago. Uh, we, we put a lot of time and effort to 
um, marketing the, the you know for for everybody to call it electronic vaulting, and of course we we keep changing the vernacular over the years. But really, the, you know, the the general vaulting, making sure that the asset and that unique asset exists in one single location, and the integrity of that asset is properly managed. Um, you, you have integrity checks, an audit trail that identifies who had access to the document, when, where, why, how, um, all the way down to you know, the secure storage of it, moving all the way through the transferable record services, providing a means to securely transfer that one single unique asset between parties. Um, and, and when I say between parties, whether it's two physical parties, you know, between an originator and a custodian, um, or whether it's within one environment, but between different entities, whether you move uh, the deal from a credit facility to a special purpose vehicle, um, or whether you move, the, move it from one investment vehicle or fund uh, to another, being able to securely identify who has ownership or custody of that electronic asset um, throughout its entire life cycle. And, and we certainly could, could go on and, and dive down into to each of these bullets much deeper, but, but generally the concept at a high level is you, you start with an executable document, taking customer-specific data, putting it into a document, enabling them to electronically sign that document, regardless of where they are on the planet, and then managing the uniqueness and authenticity of that electronic asset uh, post-closing, enabling all of the third parties who might have interest from investors to custodians to, to servicers, all within a secure manner and a scalable platform. Great. Thanks very much, John. So before we, before we hand it over to Thomas from Funding Circle, uh, what we have found helpful in the in, in, uh, in webinars past is to ask a couple of questions to help uh, help Thomas in this particular case get a sense of the audience he's speaking to. So what we're going to do here is, is ask the first one, has your company adopted a digital transaction management solution? And then you should see on the right-hand side of your screen the ability to answer yes, no, or, or considering. I'll give it a couple of moments here. Looks like most of you are con either in the considering or the yes camp. Uh, it doesn't seem like very many people are in the, the no camp, so that's good. Glad to hear that. Of course, I could have guessed that by virtue of the fact that uh, you've been on the webinar. Let's go ahead and, and close down that poll question, and we're going to ask one more question, and then we'll hand it over to Thomas. Do you feel there is a consistent digital industry standard for originating and managing MPL assets? Again, we open this question, it should be the same thing, yes, no, don't know. Looks like about 50, 50, no, and don't know. So that's, uh, that's good, interesting. It, you know, that's and this is John. I think that it, that is very interesting. Uh, as as we see in the in the market, especially the the MPL market, a lot of your traditional financial assets, uh, there have been a lot of processes and standards um, that have been built around the the original. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I think automotive or mortgage. There have been a lot of processes and standards built around the origination of those assets, and how investors um, and, and the secondary market play with those assets. I, I think we've seen a lot of. Uh, I don't maybe when you use the word fragmented, but a lot of different ways in which marketplace originators are, are originating or processing or managing or storing um, these assets. And surely from an investor's perspective, I, I think uh, what, what I've identified is the need for, for more of a, a level of consistency with how the market uh, treats those, those assets once it gets to, to the secondary market. Um, and surely the way that, that those assets are managed, where they're managed, and, and so forth. So it's very interesting. Great, thanks. So before I hand it over to, to Thomas from Funding Circle, just a quick reminder, everybody, that we are collecting questions in the bottom right-hand corner. You see a Q&A box. I've got a couple already, but especially as Thomas is going through his material, just want to do a quick reminder. So with that, go ahead and hand it over to Thomas.
Great, thanks. Uh, first of all, just wanted to thank the DocuSign and eOriginal teams for inviting me to speak here and helping me to put my presentation together. I'm uh, just trying to collect the slide here. Uh, what I thought I would, I would start with is maybe just sort of a high-level summary of what marketplace lending is, and I thought maybe the most useful way to, to get into that was, was just to sort of describe what the marketplace model is. I'm sure that a lot of folks here on the call are familiar with companies like Airbnb or Uber. You know, generally speaking, marketplaces disrupt traditional business models by removing middlemen, reducing information asymmetries, and connecting supply directly with demand. In the context of marketplace lending, and I, I guess I'll, I'll speak more to small business lending since, since that's really funding circles focus, uh, we've seen over the past few decades, even before the recession, that banks were, were largely pulling out of small business lending. Um, I think this was a result of, of regulatory restrictions. I also think that there was often um, sort of dated technology or, or credit models that made it challenging for these traditional lenders to profitably underwrite small business loans. You know, the result of that, I think there was a, a treasury um, figure that came out that I think each business day, over 800,000, or sorry, 8,000 businesses uh, across the United States were failing to qualify for commercial bank loans. So there were, there were millions of small business owners that were left without access to, to the financing that they need to grow their businesses, hire employees, and, and stimulate the economy at large. So marketplace lenders like Funding Circle have sort of entered the fray, and we're working to sort of find better ways to serve small businesses by leveraging technology and really emphasizing our strong focus on, on customer experience. So to delve a little bit more into Funding Circle specifically, we are the, the leading global marketplace for small business loans. You'll see from the slide that we're currently operating in five different geographies, the UK, the US, Germany, Spain, and the Netherlands. We've raised uh, $273 million in equity capital from a lot of the same venture investors that actually backed companies like Facebook, Twitter, Airbnb, and Wealthfront. And since we started in 2010, We've actually grown to over 450 employees across those various geographies, and we've helped over 45,000 investors lend over $1.5 billion globally to small businesses. And these fixed income investors, they range from some of the largest hedge funds in the world to the UK government to uh, accredited investors even. And our business model is really to connect creditworthy small businesses who want to borrow with accredited investors and institutions who want to lend. We, we really do this by leveraging technology to cut out the middlemen and, you know, along the lines of the marketplace model that I was just describing in the last slide, we're really able to connect supply directly with demand here at, at minimal cost. The result of all this is a transparent marketplace that gives small businesses access to fast, affordable financing, and it also gives our fixed income investors exposure to a fixed income product, small business loans, uh, that historically has been kind of difficult for them to access. So our U.S. Uh, uh, small business product is a five, one to five year secured term loan. Um, it's uh, uh, sort of range, ranges in rates uh, as low as 5.49% all the way up to I think a little above 22%. Um, our success as a business really depends on underwriting risk appropriately and delivering excellent customer service to our borrowers and, and investors. So over the next couple of slides here, I'll try to walk you through um, exactly how we use digital transaction management to do that. Uh, looking at sort of what happens when we um, send out loan documents to our borrowers, you know, a, a borrower will be conditionally approved for funding by our underwriting team. We'll then send out the loan documents for execution. There's usually a, a cover page that's included there that has uh, a list of, of, of maybe one or, or maybe a few additional due diligence items that we want to see before we unconditionally approve the borrower for funding. The borrower uh, will get the loan documents. They will execute them. Any guarantors that are party to the loan documents will execute them. The borrower will send back whatever those additional due diligence items that we requested were. Once we've reviewed those due diligence items and, and approved the loan for funding, we'll countersign the loan documents in DocuSign. 
And at the moment where we countersign, an authoritative copy, which, which as John mentioned, is sort of a, a special term under the UCC and the UETA, is created in eOriginal and housed in an electronic vault that's maintained in Funding Circle's name. If you look to the next slide here, you'll, you'll see some testimonials from, from our borrowers. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to you guys to read on your own time, but what I really want to emphasize is, you know, from the borrower's perspective, the ease and, uh, and speed with which they're able to go through our application process and close the loan. You know, from our perspective at Funding Circle, I think that using these digital transaction management solutions really allows us to create, issue, and execute loan documents quickly. It allows us to automate a lot of the processes that might otherwise require a lot of human beings needing to focus on a lot of granular details. And, you know, all of that reduces the possibility of manual error. Um, by, by way of comparison, in my career before Funding Circle, I was a leveraged finance attorney at a number of law firms, and I'm sure others can share similar experiences, but I remember more than a few um, stressful nights and mornings around closings where, you know, we were scrambling to come up with signature pages because somebody had forgotten to sign something or mis-executed something or maybe a signature page that was required for closing was, was caught up in a weather delay and we didn't have it in our hands in order to close. You know, none of that noise um, really comes up in, in the digital transaction landscape. You really are able to transact much more quickly, uh, much more efficiently, and, and that's a great result for borrowers. I think that's a great result for lenders, and it's really a great result for, for, for the platforms as well. If I look to, to the investor side here, I'll, I'll sort of start by, by walking through, I guess, how does the, the purchase settlement process work, and, and I'll try to describe a little bit of, of the advantages that investors and, and third-party service providers see here. So at the moment in time where this slide begins, Funding Circle has made a loan to the borrower. Uh, the authoritative copy of the loan documents are being maintained in our electronic vault in eOriginal. And we've allocated the loan um, for sale to a whole loan investor. We will settle the sale by transferring that authoritative copy of the loan documents from our electronic vault to the whole loan purchaser's electronic vault. The purchaser will wire the purchase price for the loan to us. And we've already filed a UCC-1 to perfect our security interest in the borrower's collateral. We will file a UCC-3 to evidence the assignment of that security interest from us to the whole loan purchaser. Why does this really benefit investors? Um, a few things. I mean, first, they get the authoritative copy of the loan documents more quickly than they probably would if we had to mail them wedding signature pages. Also, you know, we're able to automate processes, and so whole loan buyers and their custodians can review and validate the purchase loans a lot more quickly, and, and actually they can, they can oftentimes extract information through an API or similar technology and, and sort of do this automatically. Um, I mentioned this in the context of, of the borrowers executing the loan documents, but the room for manual error is, is also mitigated here. You don't necessarily, you know, have somebody affixing the wrong signature page to the wrong loan document and have to go back and, and correct those types of errors. It's also, uh, as John mentioned, very clear who has held the authoritative copy of the loan documents at each point in time. Um, so arguably this is, this is a more airtight system than I think what the wedding signature page world offers. And, you know, lastly, I, I want to emphasize, I think, the importance of, of educating whole loan buyers and their custodians, servicers, backup servicers, rating agencies, and, and, and other third parties just about how this process works. Um, when I started at Funding Circle, there were really only a few companies in the market that understood how these digital transactions work and, uh, and were willing to custody electronic loan files. That number's really multiplied, uh, I think, in the last year or so. And that's, that's a great result for, for platforms and for investors alike. There are a lot of venerable financial institutions that have started coming to the table and, and working with these systems. I think, you know, the efforts of folks like Jason, John, and their teams has been really critical to the growing acceptance of digital transaction management. Um, but I think it, it remains really important to educate the market about how these systems and products work. And, and I think really to emphasize that this isn't something completely different or unfamiliar. It really is more... Uh, a continuation of or improvement on the wedding signature page world that we're all very familiar with. So um, do want to commend the DocuSign and, and eOriginal teams for, for their work kind of educating the market about this. So looking ahead to where I think the use of digital transaction management in marketplace lending is going, 
Um, as I mentioned, I think it's important to continue educating investors and their service providers about how to use these systems and products. Uh, I think for, for folks who work in, in operations in particular, um, you know, working with custodians, servicers, backup servicers, and the like, understanding exactly how to use DocuSign and eOriginal or, or, or similar platforms will be really important. I think it'll, it'll actually make a lot of their lives easier since, as I mentioned before, the room for manual error is, is greatly reduced when you're using these types of solutions, and you can do things much more quickly than you could in, in the old wedding signature page world. And then lastly, I think the market will probably look to some measure of, of predictability and how courts are going to interpret and apply loan documents that have been electronically generated and executed. There's, there's definitely already case law around this issue. And, uh, you know, while none of us ever really look forward to situations where these loan documents need to be enforced, I think it will continue to build confidence for whole loan buyers and, and warehouse lenders and rating agencies as well to see that these loan documents are enforced with the same uh, strength and effect as kind of traditional wedding signature pages would. So I'll, I'll sort of summarize here by, by I think, recapping a lot of the, the themes that you've seen in my previous slides. I think, you know, streamlined customer experience for borrowers, investors alike is, is just critically important to Funding Circle. Using systems like DocuSign and eOriginal, borrowers get through the, the loan application and closing process much more quickly, and investors get their loan documents much more quickly um, upon settlement of purchase. We're also able to generate loan documents more quickly and more consistently. It's, it's always good to minimize um, exceptions from your process as you continue to scale your business. Uh, I mentioned before the, 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 the possibility of API integration when talking about how investors can leverage this technology. I think that's a major benefit to using digital transaction management. And similar to the point around scalability, you know, a lot of the processes around generating loan documents and reviewing them can be automated, which you know, I hope we'll, we'll continue to lower transaction time and, and costs for everybody involved. Uh, you know, eliminating the room for manual errors is also going to be important. It'll lead to more predictable results for, for larger transactions, and uh, I think it'll just continue, as I, as I mentioned, to lower transaction time and costs. And then lastly, you know, faster transaction times is, is a critical part of our mission of delivering sort of white glove, seamless customer service to our borrowers and investors alike. And so, I think the more that transactions can be seen as a part of kind of everyday life and, and something that's easy for all of the parties to carry out, uh, the more that we can sort of all focus on our businesses instead of, you know, worrying about chasing wedding signature pages and, and all the stresses that, that you used to have to deal with in the wedding signature page world. So uh, with, with that, I'll, I'll sort of throw it back to, to the DocuSign and the original teams. Great. Thanks very much, Thomas. So. Just a quick reminder, in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, there's a Q&A box. If you have questions there, and we've had a few come in already, please enter them there, and we'll get to as many as, as we can. So the first one uh, to actually came in for you, Thomas, and uh, the, the question reads, do you come across loans that are out for review that need to be corrected or edited? And if so, how do you handle, how do you handle the edit process? Sure. You know, I think, you know, when I started at the company, um, we we were much smaller and, and some of our processes were, were more manual than they are today. Um, and, and in those days, you know, we would occasionally have uh, loan documents that would need to be reissued, you know, or uh, a borrower might have, uh, you know, misspelled his or her name or, or, or you know, there's some cosmetic change that needed to be made. And, and it was actually a fairly seamless process there. You know, we would we would rescind the loan documents that we had issued to the borrower. We would correct whatever needed to be corrected, or if there was a problem with, with the borrower or guarantor executing, um, we could just reissue to the entire suite of, of obligors and have them re-execute. But that, that doesn't happen so much today. Um, again, our, we're just, I think, far, far larger. Our systems are far more automated than they used to be. Um, but when it did come up in the past, it, it, it wasn't a major imp impediment to try and get this stuff re-executed. Great, thanks, Thomas. So uh, another question, and I'm not sure if this is for you, Thomas, or this might be even for you, John. Uh, the, the DocuSign eOriginal solution, is, is, it, is it? can you give third parties access to that system? Uh, and this is John, certainly I could uh, take that. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, you know, if you think about the natural progression of the process, uh, DocuSign would, would 
be used to to assist you in originating and electronically executing uh, the deal, and then the, the you know e original would work uh, within the system programmatically to create that e original deal and manage the security and permissioning uh, post closing. So our system enables you, whether it be um, regulators uh, such as the you know the SEC or the CFPB, it enables you to dictate who has permissioning to do what. Uh, so in all things cases, you can invite servicers into, into the system and set them up with a specific uh, permissioned user account that enables them to look at and feel and touch only specifically what you've dictated. Um, and of course, really getting as granular to, to ensure that uh, one might only have the permissions to look at review copies of the document for auditing purposes, uh, but certainly doesn't have the permission to execute anything that we would consider an important action, such as destroying, transferring, or trying to remove that, that electronic asset from the system. So it certainly enables you to open it up to other parties as need be and set the permissions um, that are based on what, what the expectations of that, that third party might be. The good question. Got it. I got it. Yeah, I got a, actually a similar question from somebody that's on the DocuSign side, for, I guess for Jason here. Uh, and it's, uh, what is the process that, that DocuSign employs to validate the identity of the, the signers? And then they had a follow-on question about if that process uh, had ever been challenged legally. Yeah, great question. And this is Jason with DocuSign. And um, within the DocuSign platform, um, we're very flexible in regards to different ways to authenticate your borrowers. Um, so uh, there's a few different ways that you can look at it. Um, from different partners that we leverage, such as LexisNexis on the ID check for out of wallet questions. Um, I think more importantly, um, what DocuSign is going to provide, especially for the marketplace lenders that have those fully online um, portals where they're conducting businesses at, is going to be what we call the certificate of completion. Uh, you know, contrary to say a click to a degree agreement that some um, organizations use, DocuSign is going to provide a lot more behind the scenes information, um, which is going to again keep you in good spirits with the regulators and the examiners that are going to take a look at your processes. Um, so I know it doesn't directly um, answer that question, but I think. A good point that I wanted to um, highlight is that that certificate of completion that DocuSign is going to stand behind the execution of that document on the front end um, and then be able to uh, transfer that directly into their original vault. Jason, okay, so we had another question from another uh, another attendee that's on a similar topic. And I think you touched on, on, on one or two of these, but can you talk a little bit about the different verification methods that you could use with DocuSign? Yeah, absolutely. So um, several different layers of authentication um, that you can use for, uh, you know, a borrower, for instance, that is going through this process. Um, one would be an access code that is done, um, which is a one-time one -time shared secret between, say, the organization, um, uh, yourself, and that borrower. Um, another would be um, utilizing, again, a partner of ours, LexisNexis, to do those out-of-wallet questions, right, to go even further um, into that authentication method um, where it will request, you know, simple information from your borrower, um, and then it will generate those out-of-wallet questions to go through um, and be able to further authenticate them. They will need to pass, and all that gets recorded in your audit trail um, with that certificate of completion. So those are a few. Um, by default, DocuSign also does uh, email verification. So that's the lowest and kind of the minimum that's required for the federal e-sign law, which DocuSign does warrant in our terms and conditions. Great. Thank you. Uh, a question, I think, probably for, for Thomas. Once the authoritative copy is transferred to a cust uh, custodian's e-vault, uh, or maybe let me say that a little bit differently, does the, does the uh, e-vault need to be on the same platform or technology as the e -orig original funding circle e-vault? Uh, I I believe so. That John John may have uh, uh, more experience with this than I do, but but in, in my experience, um, whether we're transferring directly to uh, a vault that's held in the name of the whole loan purchaser itself, or whether they've appointed a custodian, uh, the transactions that we've done to date in the original, uh, that the transferee has always had in any original vault as well. John, I'm not sure if you you have any sort of differing experience on that. 
It, it, thanks, Tom. I, yeah, certainly. Well, you know, in most, in most cases, I'd agree. Today, we're we're seeing, uh, you know, we're working with a lot of investors, funds, custodians, and, and other third parties that that are enabling themselves with with the original technology. Uh, of course, if you kind of if you think about um, the the broad. Um, brush of eOriginals platform. We touch a lot of assets and a lot of different um, industries. So we do provide a means of creating something that is that is consistent and scalable uh, uh, amongst a variety of different asset classes and secondary market needs. Uh, but you know, in those cases where, where where let's say there's there is another party that just is not able to set up an electronic vault um, through eOriginal system, uh, we certainly do comply with a variety of uh, industry standards. Uh, you know, they're anti X9 standards. One in particular, which is called TOLEC. A it stands for the transfer of location of electronic contracts. What that really means is um, you know, providing a secure manner in which you can take an electronic contract from one physical system or one physical environment and move that to another physical environment um, without diminishing the value or uh, damaging the integrity of that asset. We certainly do comply with, with that, um, but, it, but in most cases we see that uh, many of those third parties, whether it be a custodian or, or a banker, they, they simply enable themselves with an electronic vault on, on our platform. It's quite easy to, to do today and, and is done pretty quickly. Great. Thanks very much. We're, we're probably running out of time here, so I'm going to probably do two last questions and then I think we're going to, we're going to wrap up here. So the first one is uh, Thomas mentioned earlier in his presentation about automating processes, and I'm curious, uh, Thomas, both from your perspective, what some of those processes are that you're automating, and then, and then Jason, I know that you have also a lot of experience working with FinServe companies to take what's captured in DocuSign to automate stuff, and I'd also be interested in your take as well. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll respond first here, Jason. Um, you know, I, I I think the most obvious the most obvious one for me is the automatic generation of loan documents. So, you know, I mentioned I mentioned before my my prior life as a as a leveraged finance attorney at law firms, and you know, closing uh, loan transactions as as a large law firm attorney, you know, you're having to draft up a separate credit agreement or loan agreement uh, and all of the ancillary documents for each different transaction. If you were to apply, I guess, the same level of manual review in the MPL space, uh, you'd never be able to do a meaningful volume of loans. You'd always have to have attorneys or paralegals uh, looking over people's shoulders, making sure that uh, the loan documents were exactly how they need to be. For us, we're, we're able to generate the loan documents um, automatically. We do have a uh, sort of quality control team within loan operations that reviews all of those loan documents before they're sent out and issued to the borrower. Um, but that's 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 one really critical piece. I think another is, uh, you know, once we're in that sort of, uh, I guess, kind of back end world as, as John described it, where the loan has already been funded and the authoritative copy of the loan documents has already been created and, and stored in that original vault. Um, depending on our preferences or or the whole loan purchasers or custodians' preferences. Um, we're able to work with the original and, and come up with sort of more streamlined solutions for how we actually transfer the electronic loan file collateral from our vault to theirs. Um, again, when you start doing a, a meaningful volume of transactions, you don't want to have to log in every single time, look at every single loan document, uh, make sure that everything has been uh, validated sort of post, uh, post settlement. And so on the custodian side as well, uh, or the validation side, regardless of who's doing it, uh, some of our uh, investors or, or their third-party service providers have also been able to um, design technology to extract information from the loan documents, populate a separate uh, sort of tape, uh, and then have the, the tape read against the loan file automatically. So for those of you who are familiar with kind of the old um, settlement validation processes from the mortgage world, I, I think that's a vast improvement, um, at least in my perspective. Yeah, Thomas, those are those are great points. And I, I, this is Jason with 
with DocuSign, and I want to piggyback off, to, uh, off of that first point that you had brought up and, and being able to, you know, automatically generate those loan documents within your system. Um, I think that segues great into what DocuSign does well is when you have those loan documents that are automatically generated, DocuSign then makes it extremely easy in this particular case for your borrowers to be able to execute those documents. Um, whether they're presented uh, fully self-service through a web portal or whether you're doing a more manual process where you're sending them out to their email, um, your borrowers will have the ability to um, access, review, and, and get those documents signed back to John's point earlier in the presentation, really anywhere on the planet. So DocuSign's making it easy for your borrowers to do business with you, and I think that's where a lot of value is built in on the, on the front side um, with the DocuSign platform. Great, thanks guys. What, one last question, I know we're over time, but it's come up a couple of times, so I wanna make sure I put it out there. Uh, the, the question, and I think maybe this is for you, John, is how does a custodian or a trustee, or really any, I think any party that's looking in, uh, looking at a loan, how are they able to validate that what they have received or what they're looking at is the original? It, that, that's a good question, and it's certainly applicable, as you mentioned, for, for instance, a, a custodian, dependent upon the type of fund that, that is set up, there certainly are um, various uh, regulatory re requirements. I, I mentioned that SEC custody rules earlier, but um, in their day-to-day -day as a service provider for these funds and investors um, and, and originators, uh, they, they need to validate that what they've received um, is in fact, you know, control of the authoritative copy, uh, just as they would have received possession of, of that paper, tangible asset in the paper world. The original system um, has a pretty extensive um, audit trail um, that comes with it, uh, really think of it as, as, as a means of, of, of registry um, or, or recognizing custody. Uh, this audit trail identifies at any given point through through the asset's life cycle who has control of, of that authoritative copy um, and, and the legal entity name in, in which owns the, the, the authoritative copy. So the, the system comes, as I mentioned, with a pretty extensive audit trail that would indicate to not just the, the third-party custodian, but to anybody that might question them on the matter um, it would indicate and come with all the relevant information to identify that they have control of that electronic asset. A lot of it is through the data that the system has, has captured, but also the controls um, that, are, that are put in place. So within our system, that authoritative copy can only ever be in one place at one time. Um, and the, the audit trail behind the system would identify that. Great, thanks very much. So that's all the time we have for today. Oh, first, of course, I want to thank all of the attendees for joining us. I know I did not get to all of the questions that were in the Q&A section, so you have our contact information, both DocuSign and eOriginal, up on the webpage. Please feel free to contact us if you want to follow up with your specific question. And then I also want to thank Thomas, John, and Jason for joining us on today's webinar. That concludes today's session. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.